This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week, Jonathan Bennett and I talk with his boss at Hackaday, which is this awesome website that's been around for almost two decades and covers hacking everything. So his boss is Elliot Williams there. He's brand new there as an editor in chief, but he's been there at the at the publication for a long time. We cover an awful lot of ground about what hacking is really about. It's not a bad thing, it's a great thing. How it basically open source is hacking in the first place and is an older, um, hacking is an older tradition. So we cover all that and much more and that is coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 666, recorded on Wednesday, February 2nd, 2022. Hackaday. Hey, it's time for the annual Twit audience survey. The annual survey helps us understand our audience so we can make your listening experience even better. It'll only take a few minutes. Just head on over to twit.tv slash survey22 and take it today. Thanks. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Collide. That's Collide with a K. Get endpoint management that puts the user first. Visit collide.com slash twit. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash twit to learn more and activate a free 14-day trial today. No credit card required. Hello again and good morning, good evening, good whenever it is, wherever you are in the world. I am Doc Searles. This is Floss Weekly. And I'm joined this week by Jonathan Bennett, um, my co-host. There he is. Uh, hey, Doc. <laughs> weighing in from the middle of the country. Yes. <laughs> holding well, that We're down. about to... Yeah, the the middle of the country where we're about to get snow, which is pretty uh, uh, pretty rare here in Oklahoma. That. But we are potentially going to get dumped about five or six inches of snow today. <laughs> oh, really? My, uh, I was thinking in Bloomington, Indiana, where I am most of the time these these days. But I mean, there's uh, they were supposed to get big snow, but right now they're getting big rain instead. They're sort of south of the snow belt. But um, my my ancestors are on one side are from North Dakota, where they say the snow doesn't melt; it wears out. <laughs> so I don't know if it's like yeah. that in Oklahoma. <laughs> no, no, it's it's um, gets warm enough. Usually the next day for all the smel- snow to melt and go away. <laughs> yeah, well, here it is. Uh, let's see, it's uh, 61 degrees. It's sunny. <laughs> this is in Santa Barbara, California. So um, <laughs> our our guest today is Elliot Williams, who's new of or new running um, Hackaday, with which you are intimately familiar. So because you write there. Yes, uh, you know I'm I'm kind of doing what uh, what Simon did last week. I'm I'm sort of kind of doubling as a a guest and a co-host. Um, and you know, full disclosure, Elliot's my boss over at Hackaday, so <laughs> I'm only going to say nice things about him today. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when, whenever we get Leo on the show, I can say the same thing. Yes. That's great. So I I, I do want to jump into it, but first I have to let. Um, let us all know that uh, this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Collide. That's Collide with a K. Uh, it's a new take on endpoint management that asks the question, how can we get end users more involved? This is in contrast to old school device management tools like MDM, which lock down your employees' devices without considering their needs or even attempting to educate them about the security of their laptop. Collide is built by like-minded security practitioners who in the past saw just how much MDM was disrupting their end users, often frustrating them so bad that they would throw up their hands and just switch to using their personal laptops without telling anyone. In that scenario, everyone loses. Collide, on the other hand, is different. Instead of locking down a device, Collide takes a user-focused approach that communicates security recommendations to your employees directly on Slack. That's where they are on Slack. After Collide is set up, device security turns from a black and white state into a dynamic conversation. This conversation starts with the end users installing the endpoint agent on their own through a guided process that happens right inside their first Slack message. From there, Collide regularly sends employees recommendations when their device is in an insecure state. This can range from simple problems like screen lock not being correctly set, to hard to solve and nuanced issues like 
asking people to secure two-factor backup codes sitting in their downloads folder properly. And because it's talking directly to employees, Collide is educating them about the company's policies and how to best keep their devices secure using real, tangible examples, not theoretical scenarios. Collide, cross-platform endpoint management for Linux, Mac, and Windows devices that puts end users first. For Teams, that's Slack. Get endpoint management that puts the user first. Visit collide.com slash twit to learn more and activate a free 14-day trial today. No credit card required. Visit Collide, that's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash twit today. Okay, so our, our, our guest this morning is, uh, is Elliot Williams. Elliot is a lifelong hacker, a taker, a parter. He calls himself a tinkerer and an explainer, which, by the way, is what his publication Hackaday does. Hackaday is one of the most, I think, relentlessly interesting sites on the web. Uh, you're going to find something really interesting there every day. And so, so welcome aboard, Elliot. How are you doing this morning? There hey, you doing great. <laughs> for, for those seeing the yeah, visual doing part great. of this. <laughs> now, I, now you're in you're you're in München, right? Munich in Germany. Yeah, here it's nighttime, earlier. but yeah. you know, happy internet morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, the light on your door or something back there makes it look like it actually is daytime, which it is for me in Santa Barbara, which is <laughs> on almost the other side of the world. We can if we both had a slice of bread, we can make an earth sandwich out of it. Um, so, exactly. so, um, that's a hack right there. So I have to ask you first, is that a 3d printed mic mount that you've got there? It has that look. Of, of course it is. Yeah. <laughs> this is actually, it's, it's a little bit ghetto. It's, it's put together with rubber bands and stuff, but I needed a mic support and I went online and said, Hey, type, 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 enter print done. Wow. Wow, that's uh, so. So what's um, so you're you're brand new running running Hackaday. When you can you tell us a few things both about Hackaday and your ascent to the editor in chief <laughs> status, which was what I had at Linux Journal before they closed it down. So I, I wouldn't take that as a sign, but still, <laughs> tell us about yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. I've read Hackaday since probably since it began and. For those of you out there who aren't as old as I am, Hackaday started up in about 2004, and I think that means it'll be 18. Hackaday will be able to vote sometime this fall. And I started reading around about then, and then when I moved to Germany, wanted to get myself a writing gig, and so I applied. I'd been reading Hackaday at that point for like 10 years, every day, and so... It was kind of, you know, hobby become job. And then I started writing more and more. And we started doing, let's see, Hackaday most of the time writes up projects that other people do. And so they're kind of shorter pieces saying what's cool about other people's work. And right about when I came on, we started writing up our own more in-depth articles. And so I kind of just fell into that niche and kept riding it uh, all the way to the top. Let's see. <laughs> Mike, who just left us, is actually great. He's been at Hagaday for, man, 10 years, 12 years. How long has Mike been there? He's an institution. So it's, you know, it's well time for him to do something else. But uh, yeah, so I just kind of <laughs> followed up and uh, am completely happy to be still working at Hackaday and able to make my living doing what used to be like my hobby, right? Yeah, that's great. Hey, let's chat for a little bit about kind of the niche that Hackaday has found. Um, it sure. is not, as many people on our Discord seem to believe, uh, intended to help people hack <laughs> Facebook or hack their ex's email. Um, can you give us kind of the maybe background of the name and then kind of describe all all of the different things which that'll take you a minute <coughs> describe some of the different things that fit into hackaday yeah hackaday is a big church i have to say we are anything to do with electronics hardware software 
taking it apart, understanding it, using it, putting it back together, particularly in funny ways, um, <laughs> you know, just uh, any of the above. And like you say, this does kind of sometimes run toward software hacks. And for instance, you do a security column for us, and I love that. Um, but we also have a lot of hardware hacks where people are, you know, taking apart an old printer and figuring out what they can do with some of the guts to like reuse it. Or maybe they have devices that are locked down in firmware and they want to use them on their network once the original company has dropped support for it. Or people who, oh, we have some great, there's a lot of great cheap consumer stuff coming out of China these days that can be reused to make really cool, fun projects. And so there's a lot of that scene. Um, a lot of the early 3D printer slash RepRap people were, you know, into Hackaday. So there's a lot of this mechanical, robotics, computery, electro making stuff freaks. Yeah, and and there's a uh, there's an interesting crossover between that entire the the hardware realm of people, particularly the people that are willing to get out there and share what they've learned or what they know, and then what we talk about on Floss Weekly, which is you know open source software, and uh, those two those two realms touch a lot, and I guess in certain places like like firmware, and even in things like uh, the, the 3D printing, the RepRap project, uh, have become very much uh, meshed together. You want to uh, kind of chat about that? Yeah, exactly. I think that's kind of the most fertile ground for us right now, because, you know, all the interesting hardware devices we make need firmware to run. They need software to run. And these days, embedded microcontrollers and, you know, small computers, even small computers running Linux, like the Raspberry Pi series, mm -hmm. are so much more accessible that people can make their projects do much fancier things, but then that, of course, requires software. And so that part instantly runs into Linux and free and open software. But then on the fully hardware side, Basically, all of my tool chain for making PCBs, designing them, um, making 3D models for physical objects. If you're going to build a robot, it needs joints. How are you going to do this? You 3D print it. How are you going to do that? You have to have a model. This whole tool chain is all open source software these days and compilers. And like, I don't think anything I do touches non-open source software in the end. And so there's this like tremendous layers and layers and layers of open source software from, from the operating system all the way down. And the really cool stuff these days is not just firmware, not just hardware, but that interacting with more complicated systems. And so there's room for software developers to come in and make our devices work better too. And it's really fun. And I don't know really what the difference between software and firmware is anyway. But when we write about firmware or a project, it's open source all the way. It's open source hardware. That is, you can see what's going on and you can make it yourself. It's open source firmware. Somebody's got the code that runs on the raw chips up on GitHub. And then if there is a software layer, that's open source too. And so we are kind of this like, I don't know what, full stack open from like open source hardware all the way up. And some of that's just because of like Hackaday's mission, what we're all about, which is showing people how projects work and teaching you how things work. And if there's a bunch of it that you can't see because it's hands off, because it's closed up, that's not really so interesting to us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's kind of a natural outcome of what our mission is, I guess, that we really push open everything because what we want to do is show people the cool parts of other people's projects, show you how to work with these things, teach you something. 
And I think that's kind of, I don't know, when I look at systems level open source software, I think a lot of people are thinking about the software that runs on your computer and that, you know, you've got a screen and you're typing stuff into it. But a lot of the stuff we do, like with, you know, robot projects, machine projects, um, you know, musical projects, who knows what light show project, the code is running everything. And so it's there. There is this like open source firmware software kernel of everything. But that's it's not the same kind of like I'm running a program software interaction. And so maybe to some people it doesn't look the same. But the basic, you know, underlying infrastructure from beginning to end is open source. You know, uh, the the term hacking and the name hackers has been around since the 80s and open source was a military term until hackers basically took it over in 1998, early 1998. So it's been with us for more than two decades, but not far less long than, than, than the term hackers has been. It occurs to me that um, hackability is really what we mean by open source. If it's open, you can hack it. Right. And, and the ability to hack, I think is really at the core of all of it where, where I want to go with this. If, if you're up for it, um, uh, Corey Doctorow of EFF and much else has been on this case for some time, I think with limited effect because it's hard for people to get their heads around. But what we need are general purpose things. Okay, this, this gizmo is general purpose. It can be used for many things and it's open, meaning I can do stuff with it, right? And more and more stuff these days is, is not just closed source, but it's special purpose and black boxed in some way or another and more and more vertically integrated. And what I'd like to get is your thoughts about what you're up against with that. And I mean, to, to the degree to which you think maybe what Hackaday is in is kind of a fight for the future, kind of a fight for um, for openness in general and hackability in general, which I guess are the same thing. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I couldn't agree more. And the more smart, like a lot of the things around us get, the more they kind of, the more their manufacturers kind of want to use that smartness to control us and to, you know, to watch what we're doing, to monitor us. And then when their service goes out, you know, you're stuck with a brick again. And there is kind of, especially at Hackaday, other places too, this strand of reverse engineering devices in order to keep them running and in order to keep them working and in order to just simply do with them what you want to do with them. And that is absolutely right. You know, we can't necessarily make manufacturer X move to an open model, um, but a lot of them are doing it by their own free will in a way. Like a lot of devices these days have embedded Linux in them and that or invites people who know what to do with Linux systems to kind of get in there and tweak them to their own benefit. I mean, it's your device, right? So I'm absolutely with you. One of the really coolest things I've seen recently, there are a bunch of these old retired Bitcoin miners in China and the FPGA board that ties a lot of the GPUs together to do the Bitcoin mining is really interesting to people like me who like to toy around with low-level hardware and FPGA stuff like that. But these boxes are no longer profitable anymore. Like they pull the GPUs out. And so you can get these fantastic FPGA boards online for pennies that used to cost like hundreds of dollars for a dev kit. And so you can play around with these things just because of some smart hackers have kind of done the groundwork to figuring out that this is where these interesting general purpose computing systems lie and made a nice roadmap so that you can then take them and start using them for your own purposes. I'm 
I, I want to jump in here and kind of put my hack a day head on here for just a second because I think it's, it's <laughs> real interesting what you asked about. Yeah. So, Corey Doctor, I was talking about this idea of we need general purpose widgets. And boy, I could think of a bunch of them off the top of my head. You know, we got the, the Raspberry Pi. Uh, you've got the uh, the entire Arduino line. You've got the the BeagleBoard devices, uh, and you know there's there's about 15 other of these put in various places in the market boards that are de- kind of designed to be that. And what's interesting to me is at the same time you're also seeing some devices getting locked and locked locked down more and more. So it's as if the market is responding by going in two different directions. And so you've got over here this entire realm of okay, these are the things that are um, they're they're kind of containerized. They're uh, it's technology turned into an appliance. And so they're locked down and they just do the thing that it says on the tin. And then on the other hand, you've got this entire uh, market for essentially for us hackers. And well, these things are, are open and you get to play with these and you get to run your own code on them and do whatever you want to. And that seems to be not a new, new development. But, you know, I remember when there was a time that there was pretty much the Arduino and that was it. And before that, there was... Uh, what well, the basic stamp, I think, was the board way back yeah, in the right. day, and that was it. And so, you know, there's been this explosion of, and what most of it is, is little Linux boards, multipurpose Linux boards. But there's other things happening too. Uh, like uh, there are now some open source FPGA tool chains and FPGA dev kits that are being sold directly to hackers rather than just to companies that are buying a thousand at a time. And so there is, there's this interesting sea change going on. And uh, I think we probably have uh, Hackaday and places like it, you know, because there's there are other companies and organizations that kind of have the same goal. Like uh, Adafruit is one of the ones that comes to mind. The, the Raspberry sure. Pi Foundation as well. Absolutely on, on the same, you know, same team. Um, but I think it's thanks to, you know, thanks to us and people like that, that that market is kind of exploding these days. Yeah, and I think it's a really interesting, like, zeitgeist that we have this kind of maker market slash hacker market and that people are showing that they're super interested in doing their own stuff. And I really like that because part of what really appeals to me about the hacker mindset anyway is that I'm kind of a continual hobbyist. Like I like open source stuff because I can look at the code because I can play with it. You know, Mm -hmm. it's something that I can go in, see how it was done, but then also tweak it if I feel like it. And when you get to kind of a certain level of familiarity with hardware hacking, it's the same sort of thing. And then to have manufacturers come out and say, look, here, we'll make stuff for you is really fantastic. And I'll tell you what, I see an even stranger trend on the early vision radar at this point which is there's a lot of open source projects which have a firmware component, they have a hardware component, and they don't want to mass produce the hardware component themselves. And so what they'll do is they'll make a, like a demonstration project. They'll make like a, a representative hardware layout for this thing, and they'll open source the software slash firmware that goes along with it And some savvy small companies in China will see this and they'll say, ooh, we can make a buck by manufacturing that open source hardware and selling it to go with the firmware. And so what we've seen now, like this is weird, I fly remote control airplanes. In the last couple of years, there's a group, Express LRS, which makes a radio protocol of their own and they built like a little demo radio board and four or five of these small agile Chinese remote control manufacturing companies have jumped on it. And in the last year, it's totally bandwagoned and it's gotten to be, it's now an industry standard and it was entirely firmware written by hackers in order to bait Chinese manufacturers into building the hardware for them because that's the hard part and that's what they're good at. And I've seen a ton of these projects before in the past where like there's a, oh man, there's an AVR tester. Half of the really cool 
Chinese low-budget electronics gadgets that you can find out there are based on open source designs and open software. And in the early days, sometimes people were trying to sell this hardware themselves and were bummed that they were getting copied by companies that were much better at producing in scale than they were. And so there was a lot of, in some of the early days, I think there was a lot of hate for the Chinese companies doing this. But now you see the shoe on the entirely other foot. You see open source developers writing stuff to fool them into getting their stuff produced in series for them. And I just love that. You know, you know it's interesting that um, uh, a sort of old assumption was that what, at least in the open source software world, what was done 20, 25 years ago was let's uh, let's knock off Windows in a way with KDE, uh, at least the user interface. Let's knock off um, the the Microsoft productivity suite um, with Open Office or or whatever. But what you're talking about here is is where the hackers take the lead with this bait. I love the idea of bait. Um, and actually do like the first iteration of something that becomes a standard once it gets implemented in the world because you throw it out to the people with the, who have a low threshold of implementation, primarily in China. And it doesn't have to be in China, I suppose, but that's where it is. Um, that seems to be like a whole different model. Have you, have you written much about that yet? Not super much. Actually, that's a great... Original, that's a great piece. That's a I should assignment. write that up myself. Thank you. I've, I've been thinking about it for a while. I guess I must have written it up for one of the newsletters sometime along there. But it is a change, and it's a really interesting one. And it's kind of made possible by the openness of the firmware and the openness of the hardware designs. And the other thing you see then is, of course, people who have weird niche needs can then buy this consumer hardware, reflash the firmware to fit their particular circumstance, and then they can make it do what they want. And so it's almost, in a way, heading toward that kind of universal devices idea, or at least the more user-controlled, more flexible devices. In the particular case of like ELRS, again, it's for remote control I think it was originally for remote control quadcopters and racing quadcopters. And so they were trying to get super low end-to-end -end latency down for the people who do this really twitchy quadcopter racing stuff. But then they found along the way that it could do really long-range stuff. And so they started playing around with that. And then they found that just by reflashing the firmware in these devices, you could make it control the plane directly instead of controlling the plane's IMU and the plane's brain. And then everybody is just taking things out in the directions they want to. And it's really lovely. And I, I shouldn't yammer on about this one project because it's really just one of many. If you follow along with, you know, any of these projects you see on Hackaday, a lot of the times people are saying, oh, that's great. I'll run with it. And again, that's also... You know, that is the open source ethic right there, right? It's like, here's my code, take it and run with it. And someone else does. All right, Elliot, I want to, I want to jump back in. It's my, it's my turn again. Uh, this this is it. fun. Um, so there's a, boy, there's a couple of different directions I want to go. Um, let's, let's talk about, let's talk about everybody's favorite subject, the Hackaday commenters. Huh? <laughs> Every <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> yes, uh, slightly notorious, I think, around the internet. Every once in a while, Hackaday commenters kind of get out of hand. Um, but, boy, what I've noticed on my articles is we have, and we've talked about this before, we have put together a group of really skilled people that read Hackaday, that know a whole lot, a whole bunch of different topics and their BS meter is tuned very well, and they have absolutely no problem letting you know about it. And while sometimes it's not the most pleasant thing to read, it keeps us honest. And I have been, I have been rightfully called out multiple times before. And I think it's fascinating how good the comment section is at, you know, sniffing something up, telling you, you know, the information that you missed or the thing that you, you, uh, interpreted incorrectly somebody in the comments has the answer and it's it's fun what 
it, it's, I just, I love it. I honestly, I like, I, even doing the moderation, every once in a while, there's somebody that's just a, <laughs> a total loser, but I really enjoy the Hackaday Commenters. It's just about one of the, my favorite things about the site. What do you, yeah, what well, do you think, is, Kelly? You, you it saying? is the internet, right? There are <laughs> trolls on the internet. I don't know if this is news to you or not, but um, yeah. But then what's interesting about the Hackaday readership is that there is this incredible depth and some people are just super knowledgeable and it's a, it's a rare topic that somebody doesn't really know something about. And so those are the nuggets. Like that's what's good about the comments on Hackaday is that when somebody, let's see, we wrote a Dan Maloney, one of our writers who actually is a, a PhD biologist, wrote up an article about nitrogen fixing processes, the Haber-Bosch process, and how it can be improved and new developments in fixing that. Why is this relevant? This is what makes the ammonia that makes most of the world's fertilizer. And so it's like one of the single biggest energy expenses on the planet. So if you can tweak this pr procedure to work better, you have a huge impact on humanity and our ability to feed ourselves. So big think topic. And of course, we get someone in the comments who's like, you know, this is actually a really hard problem. I've been playing around with the Haber Bosch process myself and trying to improve it. And look, here's my page. And my God, he had. And it was fantastic. And, you know, it was this kind of like random for us. Like, it's, it's kind of unusual for Hackaday to be doing chemistry hacks like this. We, it's not really our daily bread. But even when you get that far out, you'll get someone in the comments who has done actual work on this topic. And it's just lovely. Yeah. All right. So the other thing that I wanted to talk about, and uh, this, this one is, this one is different. Uh, it's, it's almost my story on how I came to Hackaday. Uh, that and that is, goodness, Hackaday is a great educational resource. Um, I, I want to say I first found Hackaday. It must have been very, very soon after it launched. Uh, I was trying to, to wire the, I was living in my parents' house. I was trying to wire it for Ethernet. And I believe Hackaday is one of the places I found discussing how you make Ethernet cables. And, right. you know, that was kind of what hooked me. And then you stick around and you you keep seeing the different projects people are doing. And you suddenly say to yourself, oh, I, I want to try to do that too. And... You know, if somebody were to follow Hackaday with that kind of mindset for say ten years, I, I'm honestly thinking that you you would approach something uh, analogous to a bachelor's degree in whatever field <laughs> it is that you're pursuing. Um, I, do we get stories where people say, "Hey, I've built my career on you know starting reading Hackaday when I was a teenager"? Does that does that happen? It seems like it must. Oh. Man, you have no idea all the time, actually. And this sounds like one of those super corny things that the editor-in-chief of Hackaday would say, but it actually <laughs> does happen all the time. And we get people who are like, you know, Hackaday saved my life. And they're serious. And, and I know how this goes. Like, I fell into Hackaday in the very early days as well. I had just moved to Washington, D.C., where I was working I, this was kind of the beginning of the second wave hacker spaces in America time slash scene, the beginning of the maker movement wave as well, right? And I was one of the people who ended up founding this hacker space in DC and a bunch of us were there and everyone there read Hackaday every day. And so I was holding down a, a microcontroller Monday it was a microcontroller programming and applications kind of day and night, weird, whatever. We're firmware writing nerds, right? And mm -hmm. the you'd come up with some interesting project that you saw on Hackaday and say, hey, I saw this. And everybody else saw it also on Hackaday. And early on, Hackaday was kind of this like newsletter of the hackerspace scene. It was like the newsletter of, you know, this is the cool project you need to check out. Here's a cool technique. Here's something you need to see. And then 
as our hackerspace grew, we got some people who were kind of younger and, you know, really smart, but maybe school, their school honestly failed them. Like they were kind of too smart for the way that they got put into this like high school or, or junior college or whatever. And they fell in with us and, you know, the, most of them are engineers now, um, and most of them have, you know, good, good, reasonable jobs and, you know, and are happy with their life about it. And you see this all the time, and it's really interesting. And I think that's Hackaday's other secret purpose. Like, the one thing we really like to do is show you really cool hacks, really cool tech projects. But then the side, the other side of that coin is that we're doing what Mike used to call kind of normalizing science and and technology and software writing and hacking. And I think normalizing makes it sound like we're a bunch of real freaks and that we actually need normalizing somehow. Like this is a normal <laughs> part of human endeavor to create stuff and build stuff. And it's maybe even the most human thing, right? Like we don't need normalizing, but there's a lot of you know, geeky kids, folks in college who are interested in this stuff and don't feel like they have a community. And that's one of the really biggest kind of impacts that I think Hackaday has had on the world over the last 18 years is that you get a lot of people who are smart but otherwise left out and they find this community of people who also like to reverse engineer old Game Boys just for the heck of it. And, you know, it's it's fantastic and I love it. And it gives these people an outlet for doing their incredibly creative, hyper-technical stuff and sharing it with the rest of the people in the world who enjoy it. And it turns out there's more of us than you'd think out there. So we do have a live chat for this, and we just got a, a great question from Mashed Potato. And I know it's a good question because I know some of the backstories to this. Uh, Hackaday, given its name, it sounds really bad. Uh, do we oh, ever man. get hassle? Do we ever get hassled from authorities or companies uh, for the name or for things that we cover? Yeah, so I'm with Doc. I, I mean hacking in the old school hacking like playing around with computers hacking sense and not necessarily the criminal sense. <laughs> On the other hand, the broader society does not always fully understand this. And we've gotten Hackaday blocked from public library systems. Uh, we've gotten it hit by, you know, companies safe for work filters and things like this. Most of the time, what happens is someone who was reading Hackaday at this institution will complain and get it undone. And we've been on more blacklists and I think off of more blacklists than you can possibly <laughs> imagine. And I love that we get off of them. That's kind of demonstrates enlightenment on the part of the administrators of these lists. But, you know, it's, it's a bummer we ended up there in the first place. Yeah. Uh, has Hackaday ever gotten anything like a, a DMCA request because we reviewed some product and, and gave it failing marks? <laughs> huh. Interesting. We've gotten manufacturers to complain about our reviews or wish that we change them. <laughs> uh, that's not our that's not our deal. Uh, we're extraordinarily editorially independent. Um, and yeah, we, we have to say no in those situations. And the truth is, it's a lovely position as an editor to be in that you have such a picky audience that if we did something stupid like sell out, they would call us on it and they would say, hey, you know, we're not going to read Hackaday anymore. So in some sense, it would be suicide for us to sell out, which is a really fantastic position to be in because I don't want to anyway. But at the same time, we couldn't. So kudos, Hackaday readers. <laughs> yes. Uh, I almost... 
I almost suspect that if we were to try to do something like that, uh, someone out there would fork Hackaday. And, uh, you know, there would be uh, hackaday-next.org or whatever. And uh, just go and somebody would just go and and scrape all of the old articles and just start new with the new team. Um, So I think... Uh, I think everything on the site is actually licensed under one of the uh, Creative Commons clauses, isn't it? So someone could actually do that. I, I, I think. Oh, I don't think so. I think we oh, have is that, is that not the case? Okay. most of our yeah. stuff. No, yeah, no, yeah, I didn't we, say that. We Strike get that from the record. Who, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, we get people who who mirror our website frequently um, for their own commercial gain, and we send them, you know, warning letters because. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, we do need to be Hackaday and we do need to control our brand and keep other people from, you know, misrepresenting what we're into, right? Yeah, this is this is very true. Hackaday, Hackaday is not a charity. We, the the writers do actually make money from it. Some of it is it is our primary income. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, turn off your ad blocker when you go to Hackaday and all of those things. <laughs> Nah. Uh, do do what you need to do. But <laughs> as long as you're reading Hackaday, I'm happy. There you go. Um, all right. So we I, I talked a little bit about the the idea of Hackaday's education. And something that I try to do on the security column is whenever I, you know, particularly hit a new vulnerability for the first time, uh, particularly if it's one that makes sense, is to do kind of a deep dive and try to teach whoever's reading, hey, here's the details of how this one works. And so the thought at the back of my mind is if someone were to start at the first, you know, the first uh, installment of that and read through and keep up with it, you would hopefully have a, you know, a pretty decent education in how security vulnerabilities work and how computer research works for, for security issues. And I'm kind of thinking that I'm not the only one at Hackaday that kind of sort of tries to do that. Like we, we have... Uh, the different the hack chats and all kinds of different things. It almost seems to be intentionally leading our readers through to have a well-rounded education about how to do these things. Is that is that an intentional choice that was made? Absolutely. And we get tempted, those of us who've been at Hackaday for a long time and who've been reading it forever and ever, we've seen a lot of things that will still be new to a lot of our audience. But to like to me, it's old hat. But it's totally useful to keep putting out there these kind of basic hacks in a way, because these are the kind of stepping stones that people then learn on. And so we'll see a lot of, in your case, I love it. Like in your case, it's explaining how the software exploits work. It's just the same as you know, explaining how the gear mechanism in the robot arm works. It's that same sort of thing. And it's exactly this kind of empowering people to understand how it goes and make their own afterwards, whether they want to be in the security field or, or robotics or who knows what, right? But I do think that it's important to be going back sometimes to the fundamentals. And what's beautiful is that we see fundamental hacks that are beautiful and new in like one way or two funny little tweaks on it or (laughs) using new software that's come up. There's some fantastic new reverse engineering software now that makes going after some of these devices a lot easier than it was 10 years ago. And so if you want to get a foothold into reverse engineering firmware in hardware devices, it's never been easier. Or if you have, you know, radio controlled anything, what switches, home automation systems, you name it, it's never been easier now than it is now to get an RTSDL dongle, RTL SDR dongle, <laughs> plug it into your computer. And the software layer that's developed around this has been tremendously helpful and so what you can do is you can get a a, used to be for a tv dvb tv reception card you can plug one of these into your computer it is a general purpose radio using software and a clever firmware driver for this thing 
you can then receive kind of arbitrary radio signals. And so if your home automation network is working in a way and you want to figure it out, there's software out there that will help you decode it using these really cheap tools nowadays. And so we run these articles all the time and you know that people are like, oh, that'd be really fun to try on my remote on-off wall socket. And they do. So I, I am convinced that that is actually one of the uh, one of the major services that Hackaday provides, <clears throat> and that is connecting people with each other, but also informing people about all these different open source projects that you wouldn't know about otherwise, right? Because like, where would someone have heard about Gidra except you know reading a security blog like we run on Hackaday or, or other sites? And of course, that's the NSA's tool that they released open source to reverse firmware. Um, the, you mentioned the, uh, the RTL dongle. Well, I've got one of those sitting on the desk behind me and I knew how to set this up. I first heard about the RTL from reading Hackaday. And then I got this idea of, Hey, I want a weather station, but I want to be able to snarf that data into my network automatically. And so I asked on Hackaday and, uh, I don't remember who's, it was you or one of the other guys like, Oh yeah, there's this library that does that. Well, you know what? You you plug it in, you download the library, you 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 run the example code, and within about 30 seconds, it goes, oh, yeah, I found this device and this device. Here's the current temperature. Here's the current, uh, you know, all of the data coming from it. And to reverse engineer that myself would have taken weeks and weeks of work. Would have been quite the pain. And uh, it probably oh, no, would have been... No, it wouldn't. The software for that's gotten so good now that you would just well, use Universal Radio Hacker and it would show you the signals and then you'd be like, okay, it looks like it's... <laughs> Looks like it's shift coded and you'd be like, click shift code and it would give you the bit stream and it decodes them for you underneath. And you're like, oh, that's the temperature right now. Oh, now I know right, what that right. packet does. So if you know about this, yet another piece of open source software that makes it easy to pull apart, then it's simple to do. Sure. But, you know, if you didn't and you were having to, to, to do it the hard way, oh, man, it would be such a pain. And so that's that's kind of my point. There are there are these projects that I've. I wouldn't have known about, nobody would have known about, and to have a, I guess, a clearinghouse. Uh, Hackaday works as a really nifty clearinghouse for, for this kind of information. Yeah, and there's all these kind of fringy, I'm scratching my own itch, open source software projects out there. And taken together, they build up, you know, a sum that's greater than any of their parts. Like, I have a computer-controlled router, router, one of the milli ones. It cuts things. It makes things in the real world downstairs. And it runs in the basement. It runs on completely open source from beginning to end. The firmware that drives it is Gerbil. And actually now I use a, an ESP32 Gerbil, which is a separate version of that, which lets me control it by Wi-Fi. Like the CAD CAM software I use is all free and open. The design stuff, running it, everything all along the way is padded by lots of little open source projects that people have made. And these are not the kind of big mainstream like Photoshop replacement. Like I use GIMP, sure. I use Audacity, sure. But these are big kind of mass market open source projects. Not so many people need a G-code motor controller, but I've seen enough of them now and Hackaday's written up stories about enough of them that you can find the one that exactly fits your use case. And so, yeah, that's one of the things I really love about Hackaday is that we will show you that the open source world is kind of deeper and broader than you think. It's kind of like the long tail of open source software off at Hackaday because it really is just people who are like, hey, I need this one thing to do this, you know, to do a particular thing. And so I've written this software. Hey, here, look at it. And I just love that too. Uh, all right. So I've got to ask, you've been, you've been with Hackaday for what, 10, 12 years now. What, what is the, what is the weirdest thing that you've seen on Hackaday? Uh -huh. 
man, nothing's weird on Hackaday anymore. <laughs> Does that mean that everything is? <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> what is the weirdest thing? You know, we get a lot of really cool art projects and those are kind of weird. Um, what? Oh man, I'm drawing a total blank. Sorry. Weird is actually <laughs> not the adjective I would use. Like they all are weird or maybe none of them. I think what what draws me to projects is that there's always like a a kernel of usefulness and a kernel of cleverness in there. And this is kind of the way it is when anyone is doing anything that they've mastered, right? Like you can always see how someone's clever ideas manifest themselves in a project. And when we find those little bits, I love it. And so the project can be bizarre, right? Like, a, what is this meowing box will be fuddle your <laughs> friends. It's a, you know, it's a box that meows. And so you put it in the closet and they have to find it. I built one of these <laughs> for my boss in my old job. It was just a beeper and it would beep periodically for a couple times at incredibly random long intervals. And I magneted this thing up <laughs> under his desk so that it would drive him crazy, for instance. And I think I must have learned about that idea on Hagaday. Is that weird? No, that's completely reasonable. And uh, he, knowing me, of course, the second time he heard it beep, he came straight to my office, knocked on my door, and he's like, I can't find it. Where is it? Make it stop. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you, got, you got me. <laughs> but uh, no, I... There are no weird projects. <laughs> oh, that's fun. All right. So what, uh, what's, what's next? What's coming for uh, Hackaday in the future? Any, uh, any grand schemes or ideas you have as the uh, incoming chief that you want to uh, want to tease or uh, any trends you think are interesting enough to mention? What's been interesting, if you look back at Hackaday and kind of the long view is that when we just started off, this is 2004, 2005, I wasn't with Hackaday at the time. I was just a reader like everyone else. The web was a different place and indexing things that people did on blogs was kind of Hackaday's useful function back then. It was like, it was like the hackerspace newsletter. It was, hey, here's something you need to read about so that you can talk with the other people about it. And then as the internet's kind of grown and, and developed, at the same time, people have gotten better at forming these networks among themselves. And also projects have kind of moved off to other services. Like there's a lot of action on Twitter nowadays, and there's a lot of action in YouTube and Discord channels and a bunch of other little kind of closed, disconnected communities. And I think Hackaday is kind of, changed in a way because the world has changed from being kind of a, a newsletter of public events to being us finding out what the cool things are in all of these temporary media and kind of making them permanent. And so, you know, if somebody writes up a really cool hack on Twitter, it's visible for a very short period of time. And all the people who see it then will benefit from it. But then all the other people who go looking for it a year later won't know how to find it. It's not indexed, right? They won't be able to benefit from this work. And so one of the things that I see Hackaday doing is kind of looking out everywhere. Our writers are hackers. We are in these communities looking at all of these things and collecting it all and putting it in one place. And whereas before it seemed more like we were kind of a newsletter or a newspaper, now it seems like we're more kind of this archive. We, you know, we're like the library of Alexandria of otherwise fugitive hacks. And I think that's kind of, I mean, I don't think it's changing Hackaday in any particular way. I think the world is kind of changing and our role in it is necessarily changing as well but just because that's the role that needs to be there. So you're going into a deep place there. I, uh, way back in 2003, one of my sons who's not um, especially technical, though he worked in the tech world, um, made an interesting observation that he said the live web was splitting off of the static web. 
And the static web was the one that mm. self-archived. We had this notion that the web was the library and and everything would be kind of permanent in it. And what's happened is that it's all become very temporary. And um, th there's a sense that it's all kind of snow falling on the water. So I love the, actually I wrote it down, the Library of Alexandria for Fugitive Hacks. That's almost a tagline there. That's really good. And and the, but it's also good that some of the fugitive hacks are the ones that, you know, the are offered as bait for, for folks in China to, to start making the things that we're going to need. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, we don't have a whole lot of time left here, but um, I, I want to touch on, on two things, but I'll take the first one first. And it may be too much, um, which is business model. I mean, your business model is advertising. Um, I've looked at the site. You do much less tracking than most do. When I look at the ads, they don't look like tracking based ads, actually. Um, so, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that or where you, is there, is that a stand you're willing to take or interested in taking, or are you just trying to be as moral as you can while still trying to make some money the only way you can in the world as it's currently constructed? Hackaday is in an interesting position about 10 years ago now, maybe, um, Hackaday was having trouble because the way ads are priced, if you have to go to Google or whatever, is so cheap that you can't really make money doing it. And Hackaday kind of went bankrupt. And there was a big community concern about what are we going to do? Hackaday can't stop. What happened in the end was that a company supply frame bought Hackaday and all of us in the community were at the time absolutely mortified and terrified that Hackaday <laughs> would be changed by this. But the beauty is these guys get us and what they want us to do is continue to thrive and be editorially independent and continue doing what we do. They also are have like marketing folks in place who are good at selling advertising. And so they do that for us. And we kind of just continue to exist. And it is absolutely fantastic. And the short answer to your question is, I'm on editorial and I don't have to worry about this. And it's <laughs> like we were running, you know, a newspaper back in the 90s or something where we have a journalistic slash editorial side and then an ad side. And the two are entirely disparate. And I often say it's a very weird world in which the New York Times does sponsored promotional insertion ads and Hackaday doesn't. But <laughs> ah, here we are, the last bastion of journalistic integrity. I don't, I don't get it. But it is what's happened to us. And it's largely because the folks at Supply Frame really get us and that's just lovely and they just want us to keep going because we encourage people to make cool hardware and that ends up you know kind of feeding their business model but they're super hands off and you know I don't think we're making money hand over fist but we support our writers and that is what we're about that is great and um one one quick last one. You've mentioned several times ago you worked in D.C. You came to Munich for a job that wasn't Hackaday. So what what, what has been or, or is still your day job? And maybe your day job now is Hackaday. But I, what, what's the career arc underneath the, the sort of hobby level that's turned into the professional? Is that him or me or everyone? <laughs> I, I know we lost. Stuck. I think we lost. Yeah, okay. Let's start it again. My career arc is bizarre and nobody should follow it. I studied <laughs> physics as an undergrad. I did astronomy. I totally jumped ship and did economics, got a PhD in economics, worked for the government <laughs> as an economic statistician for 10 years in DC. It was a great time, but you know, all things have to end. I met my wife and moved to Germany. I then decided to learn German, which is kind of the backwards order if anyone wants to do this. And then I decided to look for a job. 
that again is the backwards order. I had a book in me at that point because I'd been doing this microcontroller programming stuff with people in my old hacker space so long that I ended up writing a book, uh, Make AVR Programming. Go read it. It's still not super dated. Um, and I had this book in me that was just burning to get out, like a hacker's guide to programming microcontrollers. And so I wrote that. And then I was like, you know, I need something else to do. I'll start writing for Hackaday. So yeah, now it's my day job and it's a fantastic day job to have. And we do have like five other people for whom it's their day job. And it's a lovely position to be in. Most of our writers are side, it's a side gig for them. And that's also fantastic because it means we have people who are just super interested and they're just doing it for the love. So that also works out really well for us. Plus they have crazy industry insight to draw on. Um, so that's really cool too. But is my career arc one to follow? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think for a lot of the successful people, you would not want to follow their career arc. Wouldn't want to follow mine either. It's not an arc. It's more like a series of <laughs> a series of of bumps into crazy places. Um, so uh, we're actually to, down to the end of the show. We always close with a, a few standard questions. But first, is is uh, is there any question we haven't asked? that you could answer briefly that uh, you'd like to like to visit? No, I think not, actually. I think you guys have hammered it pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. So um, the next is, do you have anything to say about blockchain? Uh, sorry, about <laughs> what? <laughs> about blockchain. I, I was thinking, you know, <laughs> we should probably add metaverse and web three now as, as cliche, as yeah. modern cliches, because blockchain's actually yeah. getting to be. Blockchain, like blockchain, blockchain. Blockchain's such a great idea. And then I don't know why you'd want to turn it <laughs> into money. Like there's a, you want to see something really cool that's done with the blockchain. Go to the NIST randomness beacon. They have a random number generator that makes an endless series of random number gener random numbers that are time stamped and they're essentially blockchain together. They're hashed to each other recursively. What this lets you do is write conditionally contingent contracts based on the outcome of this random number. And it's verifiably not knowable into the future. And it's also verifiably traceable from you know the infinite future back to the time when it became no longer random. So if you want to make really cool random contracts, NIST randomness beacon <laughs> is the best use of blockchain I've ever seen. Um, plus, you know, if you and your wife are arguing about where to go out for dinner, you can look it up and say, you know, we'll check up on the NIST beacon and it's Indian if it's bigger than 0.5 and it's French if it's less than 0.5. <laughs> That, True story. that may be the best answer we've ever had to a blockchain question. <laughs> I, I love that. <laughs> Subtle arguments is kind of like the, uh, you know, the ultimate magic eight ball, only you get an infinite variety of, That's right. of possible answers. Um, okay, so two two more. What are what are your favorite text editor and scripting language? Ooh, good. I do a lot of things in Python these days. My text editor is Vim. That's boring. I was an Emacs <laughs> dude for a long time. I wrote my thesis in Emacs. I got the shift meta control X pinky and I stopped doing that and I took up Vim. Is modal better? I don't know. I can't start any holy wars. It looks like you took two sides of that one. That was fantastic. Usually people are very, you know, uh, very much on one side or the other or neither. Um, well, this has been great. I it really, it's been really great having you on the show. And we tell everybody we'd like to have them back. But uh, you, have so, you have so much going on with Hack a Day. And I'm really interested to see um, where, you, where you take it for the, you know, during your, during your time there. It should be interesting. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to be on this show. It's it's an honor to be running Hackaday right now. Like I said, I've I've loved it for man, 15 years. It's so cool to be running it yeah. and just 
make sure it keeps on going and keeps on being what it needs to be. And so, you know, read more Hagaday. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> There's a, he says is his camera like Max he says I was just gonna say some kind of a Max Headroom thing just happened there. <laughs> <laughs> that goes way back for those for the oldsters among us might remember Ma- 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 we've Max covered Headroom. it on Hackaday <laughs> yeah I'm read, sure read, read, read more <laughs> Hackaday <laughs> and that so, made it stop <laughs> so, <laughs> so Jonathan this is <laughs> <laughs> where we can, where we, <laughs> where we go into reviewing the show. You have so much oh. to cover there. It was great. It was really great having, as, as an insider, as it were, having you on this because you know what you're talking about. Yeah, there was there was a lot of fun. You know when um, when when Mike Stitch uh, announced that he was going to step down back a few weeks ago. You know, if you have a big change like that. There's the initial kind of dread of oh no, what's going to happen to Hackaday? And then they let us know that Elliot was going to take over. It's like, oh, we're okay. <laughs> I've, I've been working with Elliot the, yeah, I think the yeah, entire yeah. time I've been at Hackaday and he's just such a good guy. Um, uh, we, we do need to say uh, thank you so much to Elliot for being here. Uh, he was not the scheduled guest for today and he actually had to rearrange his schedule just a little bit to be That's here. Right. So we, we appreciate him being here. Made for a great show today. Um, and you know, obviously I'm, I'm a huge fan of Hackaday. It's, uh, it's literally a big part of why I am where I am and what I'm doing is again, because I was searching for some information and came across a Hackaday article and man, just, I got hooked. And, uh, like we said, that's true for a lot of people. There's a, and I and thank you also for, and the team for, We've had a lot of schedule. It's not so much mix up. The world happens, stuff happens, and people move around, and and we just cope with it. But um, uh, but you guys filled in for me last week, uh, and and that was great. I, I it's no secret. It's just I was I was on an unmovable treadmill stress test, so I had to like uh, like a gerbil stand on a on a treadmill and exhaust myself, and and I passed it with flying colors. I, I, I look better now than I did a year ago, so I just wanted to let people know that I may look older all the time, but my heart's still working well, so that's cool. Um, so great. So I, I, I was going to say, what, what what do you have to plug? But we know we've already been plugging it the whole show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do. I do have something else to plug, actually. Oh, cool. um, yeah. Uh, well, you <laughs> we, we've sort of been plugging it the whole time too. Club Twit over on Club Twit, the Untitled Linux Show now has its own dedicated audio feed. So make sure yeah, if you're right, not a club right. Twitter, you need to become one. And if you are, go subscribe to that and download it. Listen to it. Uh, we are trying to get our uh, we're trying to get our subscription numbers up to the show uh, because our you know what's going to happen to the show in the future kind of depends upon how many people think it's worth listening to. So go check it out. Yeah, be be there. That's great. I'm glad that that's that's happening now. And I have to let you know also next week our guest is Ramon Hedobro. I hope I'm pronouncing that right from Code C. So that should also be a good show. So until next week, uh, and I hope to see you then. I'm Doc Searles. This is Floss Weekly. See you then. Did you spend a lot of money on your brand new smartphone and then you look at the pictures on Facebook and Instagram and you're like, what in the world happened to that photo? Yes. You have, I know, it happens to all of us. Well, you need to check out my show, Hands-On Photography, where I'm going to walk you through simple tips and tricks that are gonna help make you get the most out of your smartphone camera or your DSLR or mirrorless, whatever you have, and those shots are gonna look so much better, I promise you. So make sure you're tuning in to twit.tv slash hop for Hands-On Photography to find out more.